What started out as, as perhaps um, a simple description of a region, a town, a place, um, an environment, turned into a much larger project that touched on, you know, perhaps um, what I'll say is loss of innocence, um, a sense of a view of the despoiled sublime um, America as it perhaps currently is and shouldn't be. Um, what's surprising about the work is, while it is in fact uh, that classic photographic description, it's far more nuanced um, um, and, and far more ambitious than simply those physical descriptions. It is the space in between the photographs um, that builds a narrative that is so brilliantly realized in the book, a little journey that um, was for me surprising when I started, and I can only imagine for uh, the artist uh, equally surprising as he began a project that might have had um, um, one target and ends up being something so potentially very different. It's a fine body of work. It, it speaks to the power of photographic storytelling um, at its best, and the reason that I celebrate the book as a vehicle for photographs, um, remarkable achievement. So without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Richard Wathman to ICP. Richard. I'm very happy to be here tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk and present the photographs from my book, Redwood Saw. And I'm going to also include just a few images from some of the earlier work that I did by way of describing a little bit of what led me into doing this project. As Phil kind of alluded, um, this project was a personal journey for me. It started out with a particular focus and a very particular interest that was um, narrow. And over time, it enlarged and it happened in a very organic way so a lot of the discussion that we're going to have tonight is about the way this project unfolded for me um, many of you that are familiar with me and my story know that this book was long in coming I began it in the summer of 2004 and I spent four years shooting the book and then a year printing and editing, and finally another year searching for the right publisher, and then another year working with that publisher until we proofed the book and came up with the final object. So it's, it's been a long haul, um, but it's been one that I'm very, very pleased with finally now that the result is here. Uh, this is the opening photograph from the book, and the slide lecture that I'm going to present tonight stays fairly close to the sequence of the book, but not entirely. I changed some of the order of the images so that I could talk to you about the way in which the different themes in the book developed. Uh, but this is the opening shot. It looks like the entry into the forest. In fact, it's the exit from the forest. Once you leave a redwood forest, the uh, fauna and the biology changes very quickly once you're near the coast. And these are red alders, which are what you get on your way out of the forest. Um, in the summer of 2004, I went to Northern California to an area just below the Oregon border to photograph a redwood forest. I went with the intention of making a break with the work I'd been doing previously. I had no idea that this project was going to turn into what it turned into. I usually don't like to know where I'm going. I need a beginning. I need a seed. But I like to have the space that allows for digression and exploration and change while I'm working. I want to surprise myself. I try to bring my unanswered questions to my photography. I was out there to get away from the urban landscape photography I'd been doing in New York for many years. And it was really just an exhaustion with the geography that was leading me on. 
I begun this cycle of work in 1991, which for me is all connected and part of the work I'm continuing to do by photographing in New York City. I'd made a few groups of photographs before that, and although I thought they were successful on their own terms, they were dead ends for me in the sense that continuing on with them would have created repetition and variations, but no new insights. I felt something was lacking. I felt that the questions I'd been asking myself weren't central and open-ended enough to continue to generate meaningful new work. I literally woke up one morning and said, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to look at what is around me and see if I can make work out of the immediacy of my daily experience. At that time, I had no idea that that was going to lead into landscape photography. I didn't even get out of the door of my apartment building in the East Village. I walked through the lobby on my way out to shoot, and I saw something there that I had passed by for many years, and I took a photograph. It was of these incredibly sad wilting daisies in a narrow strip of soil that extended in a brick casing around the walls of the lobby. And the soil was strewn with cigarette butts and cobwebs and bits of cellophane and what have you. But when I got home and I developed the film and printed this image, the picture was thrilling to me. Light was streaming through the filthy glass doorway, steadily illuminating darker and darker grays as you drew further into the lobby. When I looked at this image, I realized not only that it held the feelings that I had about that place all those years, but that those feelings were redeemed by the beauty of its transformation. That was the start. I proceeded to photograph along my block and through my neighborhood. And then I decided that I was going to get on and off every transit stop in New York City in all five boroughs. That took two years. <laughs> And when I was done with that, a friend asked me if I wanted her old Datsun for free. And I said, sure. Because right at that moment, I wanted to expand my circle. Eventually, I found myself in the suburbs, miles outside of New York. It got to the point where I had to drive several hours to get any place that I hadn't already been to, and the act was becoming both onerous and less productive. All of that and a lot of other complicated reasons made me ready for a change. Many impulses have to come together to result in a commitment to a long-term project that might take up a big chunk of your life. All the work I had been doing for all those years was really about what drives me crazy about American culture. It had been socially critical work, work that I was instinctively drawn to, to photograph those things that I found banal and disturbing. So I asked myself, what might it be like to try and make celebratory work for a change? I'd been to the Muir Woods several years before, which was one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. So I booked a flight, but to the northern range of coastal redwoods, because I hadn't seen it.
I had already been going out west for years, but not to photograph. I was deeply impressed by the light, the air, the space. It took many years before I had the feeling that I wanted to photograph there, partly because of my awareness of all the great photographic work that had already been made on the subject, and partly because it took a long time to feel like I was no longer a tourist. But over time, I developed strong feelings about the places I'd come to know and the experiences I'd had. And at a certain point, I suddenly felt that I had the desire and the familiarity and the curiosity to make a go of it. And the reading I'd been doing played a significant role in shaping my desires. I'd been doing some reading about nature, evolution, and the environment, Writers like Edward O. Wilson, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, James Howard Kunstler, Bill McGibbon, John Muir. That reading was on my mind. The urgent warning signs of species extinction and the importance of forests. I'd also read Annie Dillard's book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, her golden meditation on nature and what it means to be in the world. It's still one of the most important and influential books I've ever read. That combined with needing a new challenge. The focus of the urban work that I had been doing was largely on the surreptitious role of nature in urban and suburban environments. I had never photographed nature on its own terms, and I wondered what it would be like to photograph nature without the built environment and a near lifetime of lowered expectations being tied into it. I also thought it would be an interesting challenge to see if I could photograph nature without the cloying sentimentality or revisionism that can be so difficult to avoid. So I spent this first trip, three weeks by myself, in a tent, photographing every day. And it was the correct thing for me to do at that moment. I felt as though I was in exactly the right place at the right time. It was the most visually stimulating environment I had ever been in. And on top of it all, the work was a kind of joyous experience that was entirely new to me. What a differentiated pleasure after so many years to, to be photographing the things that weren't disturbing me, to be photographing in a place that was so articulated and ancient and that possessed a scale I hadn't experienced except for what it's like to look up into a star-filled sky, as far as making me feel really small in a way that I enjoy immensely. So it all clicked on that level, and I had no idea it was going to turn into what it turned into. But I quickly discovered that this forest is really just a very tiny fragment of what was originally there. It's estimated that the remaining old growth redwoods are about 5% of the original forest, and that might be a generous estimate. What remains are these museum-like areas that feel huge when you go into them. But the longer you are there, and the more you explore them, the more you recognize how fenced in the forest is how limited in comparison with what's been lost. Another impulse that accompanied my urge to take pictures in the forest is a strictly formal one. I had the desire to make complex pictures. 
This came about as a byproduct of the ongoing process of picture making. I like to see where I can go logically from where I am. For me, this has partly been a process of increasing formal complexity. The formal complexity, though, has somehow to be interwoven with logic and the emotions of the images. Or maybe I only knew that I wanted to fill my frames with as much density, as much space, as much intricacy as I could, and that the compulsion made sense to me because those qualities seem to be an echo of the forest itself. <clears throat> so composition is always a concern. You don't get away from composition. You wouldn't want to. But you also don't want anything mechanical, rote, or predictable. I don't want to just have had a pleasurable process. At the end of the day, I want to have caught the fish. I take the kinds of pictures that I would want to put on my wall and look at. The theory of composition is burdened with rules of thirds and golden triangles. Every rule can be successfully broken, and there are many games that can be played. But it was thrilling in that environment to take my photography to the most formally complex level of composition of which I was then capable. The process of composing a picture is a profoundly nonverbal one. But the best way I can describe it is I'm looking for a composition that has the maximum amount of depth, chaos, and tension while still resolving at a very high level of order. I've been living in New York for many years, strictly a creature of the sidewalk. And my childhood was similar in that there were very few opportunities to experience unspoiled landscapes. In other words, I'd grown up never really knowing how much had been lost. About 10 years before I began shooting Redwood Saw, I developed a deep curiosity about the natural world I knew so little about. So I bought a backpack and a tent and a few books on camping and just started to go out on trips by myself to see what I'd been missing. This was another impulse that led me to this project. Once we've forgotten as a culture what we've lost, where are we? That became a central theme of the book. My trips, once I began and became committed to doing all my work traveling, which has been since 2004, are usually solitary. They allow me to burrow down past the point of distraction, to listen to my own thoughts, not always a pleasant preoccupation. They can be a kind of evolving meditation. The first night out in a tent is always hard. It takes time for the mind noise to be dispersed. My dreams can get crazy, and the unconscious sometimes feels like a garbage can. The dreams I have are so obviously this waste disposal process of a relative kind. But then, if I'm alone with my thoughts long enough, and engaged in a productive project, or in what I hope will become a productive project, I always get to a good place. A lot of this is about boiling things down to what really interests me. I try to compose my thinking about my work into the simplest kind of structure imaginable. That's my advice to anybody who's doing art. What are you most interested in? What are you most curious about? I don't need to know where I'm going, as I said. But I do need the seed, and that arena of interest, if I can find my way to it, is where I realize that seed. There's always something that I want to look at more than anything else. 
It sounds incredibly simple, but that's really the key for me. A great deal of art making process is about subliminal desire. The hardest thing for aspiring creative people is to learn to trust that kind of feeling, that longing, that instinct, because they are surrounded by, who cares about that? That's been done before. And what is the point of that? An artist has to believe in his own sense and experience of wonder. Life is too precious to simply adopt other people's concerns. Of course, light itself is always key to any photographic enterprise. I've noticed over the years how my awareness of and my appreciation for certain qualities of light has evolved and changed. When I came to Redwood Saw, I had a strong desire to work with more shadow and a lot of backlight, which I knew I'd find in the forest. Redwoods are the oldest and tallest trees on the planet, reaching over 350 feet tall. When you're in the forest at midday, the light works its way down through the canopy and shafts and patches, and the contrast is dazzling. And it's changing very quickly, which is really thrilling to try and capture with a large format camera. Because if you're not really fast, by the time you've taken your camera out of your pack, set it up on a tripod, composed your picture, taken your light readings, and exposed your film, what stopped you and made you want to take that picture in the first place has disappeared. I came to think of it as similar to the discipline that a great street photographer, like my good friend Jeff Mermelstein, who's here tonight, needs to cultivate. Except you have a few minutes and a lot more process instead of a hundredth of a second and the click of a shutter to get it right. It's exciting and it can get your adrenaline going. The first decision I made was not to even try to photograph redwood trees. I didn't want to try and capture the scale of the experience. It's impossible. I decided that I was just going to photograph the light in the forest, which as I said is a great challenge because it's the fastest moving, most contrasty light I've ever worked with. I came back here twice just to pin the highlight on those leaves in the center of the photograph because I missed it the first time as I was setting up. <clears throat> this clear cut sequence which I'm about to show you begins what will become the transition from the forest to the town. When I'm on a shoot, I spend all day looking for pictures, and I never shoot more than 10 sheets in a day when I'm working with large format. I came upon this whole scene down a road called Wonder Stump. Occasionally, sometimes the world just hands you the metaphor on a silver platter. This is the final transition picture from the woods to the town. When I walked out of the woods and saw this, it was as though it were waiting for me and I realized I'd better be fast. And sure enough, the owners came out three minutes behind me. 
It was another silver platter experience. In any case, this stand of protected forest where I was tenting and photographing was adjacent to a small town called Crescent City, which had originally been covered with forests that grew all the way down to the ocean. I'd gone into the town for my supplies, and the more I went, the more it sank in that what I had come out here to do maybe wasn't what I was going to do. My familiar critical instincts reared up. Here was the better story. It had to be about shooting in both the forest and the town. I'd shot 200 sheets of film in the forest on that first trip, and I was returning home feeling certain I had made the kinds of photographs I wanted. I was pulled over in the airport by a TSA official while going through a metal detector. And when I passed through, the security guard who hadn't waited for me to inspect the film, had opened three of the five boxes of film I'd exposed. Fortunately, when I got home and developed the two remaining boxes, I realized that I just had to book another flight and go out there and do it all over again the next summer. So on my second trip, I had the whole forest experience again. But it was also on this second trip that I began to shoot the town as well, and I began focusing on the architecture. This is Highway 1, the road that many consider the most beautiful in America. For the most part, it skirts the coasts and offers crests and views of the Pacific Ocean. But when it comes near Crescent City, for some reason, it diverts into the town. Those faint mountains in the background are the redwoods. I'll circle back and talk about the nudes in just a little while. Um, I realized after the second trip that I also wanted to extend my project to portraiture. I hadn't done portraiture for many years, and I had never shot portraits with a 4x5 camera, which is a very different game from a roll-filled camera. It takes time to set up. You have to persuade strangers to let you photograph them. There has to be a thoughtful encounter with an individual. And it has to be very quick with people who, for the most part, were just passing by. I had less than five minutes to set up and shoot almost all of these portraits. But I thought it over for a year before I went out there again. And to my surprise, I was ready somehow. Um, an interesting aside, while I was in Crescent City, I kept thinking about the work of Raymond Carver as I was wandering around the town. And um, much to my delight, a friend who's here tonight, Sean Elder, who grew up in Crescent City and who contacted me when he realized I was working on this project, uh, and kindly wrote a little article about it, uh, let me know that Carver had actually gone to Crescent City a couple of times to dry out. <coughs> I had a feeling about the people that made me want to do the portraits in the first place. I was picking up on what at first I thought of as this tremendous vulnerability. And I was relating that vulnerability to what I was experiencing in the forest amid the protected remains of its once magnificent expanse. One of the conditions of modern life is that we all feel as though our lives are dictated by unknown forces beyond our control. 
It's what Bill My Moyers once described succinctly as the bleak realities of powerlessness that shape the lives of ordinary people. I wanted to photograph that. I was relating it to the way in which economic forces are bearing down upon this kind of environment and the people themselves caught up in what, for lack of a better term, I must call an unsustainable cultural and economic reality. I wanted to get at that in the portraiture. So it was really a matter of what I thought of as a kind of casting, though it took me a long time to phrase it to myself that way. The business of trying to photograph a town is a poetic act. Because a town, even a small town, is a big thing. And you have to select, edit, pare down, and represent your vision of that experience to which you bring all your baggage and your thoughts and your feelings too. Part of why this town appealed to me was that it was small. The population sign in 2004, when I began to go there, said 6,000. At any rate, the casting had to come about intuitively. One day I photographed this young girl. Actually, I was photographing this incredible car. It was a Ford Gran Torino, a paint-free junker that looked like a shark and had this unbearable bumper sticker on the back that read, I'd slap you, but shit splatters. <laughs> All on this degraded piece of roadway that ran through the commercial district. I had set up for the car when a girl, maybe 15, came riding by on a colorful bicycle that would have been more appropriate for a 10-year-old. A little girl stingray bicycle. She'd looped a plastic bag from her urn around one handlebar. She looked damaged. And just as she was gliding by, I asked if she would mind being in the picture I was taking. Her face painful with hope, looked up, up at me from behind big glasses, and she very sweetly said yes. And that evening, I thought about that touching girl. And as I was mentally reviewing the portraits I had been making, I suddenly came to realize that one of the strongest undercurrents in all the work I had been doing was trying to photograph unhappiness. And once I became clear with that myself, the rest followed more easily. In fact, I came back to ICP and SVA and began teaching a class called Photographing Unhappiness. Though, of course, there was, too, that terrible business of whose unhappiness is being photographed. How much is projection and how much is witness and testimony? Both are at play, importantly, and that's key to the tension in this work. We can try to perceive simply the cruel radiance of what is, as A.G. once famously, famously suggested. But more often than not, it seems like Anais Nin got closer to the heart of it when she said, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. The intersection of where those two forces meet is often where I like to work. That's why I've chosen to riff off the documentary form. I want it all. This truck had been sitting with that pile of dirt in that front yard for so long that the grass was about one foot tall in the back of it. I hope I can address what I find to be both painful and glorious in my work. 
I think that's why the impulse to create a celebratory body of work was upon me in the first place. I'd been doing what felt like the dark, difficult work for many years. Opening up the narrative to another realm of expression felt very important to me at that moment. One of the things I love about photography is that it's reactive. I come with my agenda, some of which is conscious, and I react to what I see. It's important to stay open. Given time, things usually do unfold. The stories are there inside you and all around you. You just have to ferret them out. As Joan Didion once said, we live by the stories we tell ourselves. I was attracted to the town for the reasons I've mentioned, for its proximity to the forest, for the fact that it was what the forest had become. But even more significant, I came to understand that the town had been boom and bust for its entire European history. At first it was a mining town and it was mined out. Then it became a lumber town and all the forest was cut, except for those museum spaces that a few people, ironically the already wealthy lumber barons, fought hard to protect. Then it became a fishing town and now it's in danger of being overfished. It began to seem that this business of successive extraction, ex successive extraction industries and again the unsustainable nature of the economic foundation spoke to issues that transcended the town specifics and made for a bigger story. For a long time I'd harbored the ambition to tell a big American story. I loved the idea of trying to get as near to the form of what I thought of as a photographic novel. One of the most important challenges I gave myself with Redwood Saw was to make a much more narrative body of work than I had previously. The novel is such a rich form and it's lasted because it's so well suited to dealing with the urgent questions of consciousness and existence that I've always wanted my work to engage. Saul Bellow once wrote, Americans are panting for meaning. And there are so many possibilities within the form, so many rich and new ways to play with it. Our need for stories is hardwired, just as our need to ask age-old questions in the context of changing circumstances is not going to go away. I also felt, and I know this is overreaching because I'm sure I didn't achieve this goal, but I also felt that I wanted to try and stretch and create something that was not just about our immediate culture, which is what any important art is going inevitably to be about anyway. How can art avoid speaking from behind the veil of its epic? But I also wanted to include some of my thoughts about the larger evolutionary picture, that life is spawned in the ocean and that forests are an important part of the Earth's next chapter. I needed to acknowledge those verities even if I couldn't represent them in ways as palpably as I would have liked. So I bounced between town and forest like a ping pong ball. Years in New York City had given me a hunger. I think the things we'll probably miss the most as this century progresses are wood and space. We're running out of both. One of the most compelling portraits for me in this book is of this teenage girl in her backyard where there is a discarded sofa and a lot of trash. The sun is at about two o'clock in the afternoon and there are clear skies. The light is blindingly revealing. The girl has on a Superman tank top and she's wearing sandals and jeans and she has her head cock looking into the camera at a 20 degree angle. To me, it's a picture of doom. I photographed three generations of this family. I came to the girl through another member of her household, the wiry woman of this portrait, who is standing in front of a rusted doorway with a tiny American flag blowing in the wind to the right. I met the older woman by chance, an absolutely charismatic woman who explained that she was part Indian. 
She had a long history of drug abuse, and she was a self-mutilator. If you look carefully at the picture, you'll see that her feet and arms have extended white patches from the wrist to the elbow, where she told me she had poured lied on herself. This portrait, taken in the same backyard in which I photographed the young girl, whom I now think of as Supergirl, shows a heavy-set, broken-looking man who I thought at the time was surely Supergirl's father, but now I'm not certain. Anyway, he was some sort of father, and she was some sort of daughter. Philip Larkin, right? They fuck you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you up with all their thoughts and save some extra just for you. Man hands down misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have kids yourself. <laughs> that was my feeling as I made my way around those portraits. And yet, and yet, the great Beckett line about how I can't, I must, I will go on. I think we're in a, a dangerous moment in America. The country has faltered and is struggling to survive from its own self-inflicted wounds. And I wanted to make a book to reflect this country and the moment that we are in, but also a book that would be subjectively accurate. I hope to arrive at that enlarged sense of experience that one has when one looks deeply at something in the way that one has to when taking pictures. It's a heightened process, like any art form. Sometimes when I'm photographing, I imagine there are these tentacles going out from my eyeballs long strings that have these little fingers on their ends, and they are literally scrubbing the surfaces of everything I look at, emotionally and physically. That kind of looking can be exhausting, but it can also be exhilarating. One of the greatest luxuries of doing this work is that you get to feel like you really are in the world, playing your part, opening out to it. So there is a portrait of a buxom young girl in a tank top in front of a bunch of tall weeds that are in flower. She's in a parking lot. While I was in Crescent City, I asked every single waitress and every single barista to pose for me. And this girl was working at a coffee shop. She looked about 18, and I asked her if I could take her picture. She said, oh yeah, sure, but could I come on back tomorrow when she was on break? And when she came back the next day, she had gotten herself made up to the nines. Make up like she was going to the prom. Hair done in this complex, pristine way. Wearing her best jeans. Her brand new sneakers. Her new sleeveless shirt. When I photograph people at first, I never give any direction. I just want to see what they will give me. And as long as it doesn't seem like it's burdened with self-consciousness, with artificiality, I take it, whatever they give me. She jutted her huge bust out, and here she was in the spring in front of this colossal acre of weeds that were just flowering in a parking lot. And it said so much to me about the town and beyond the town about the human condition. I'd guess this girl has two kids by now. I'd bet on it. She was right at that incredible moment where she was going to take her greatest asset, which was her youth and her body, and fling herself into the future. And that was poignant to me. And it made me think of doing the nudes. And early on, having decided on the nude, I made it a point to have an equal number of males and females. There's a lot of eros remaining for me in that town. It was a deep vein. How can I make this richer? Taking more pictures of the forest had led to taking pictures of the town, which had led to taking portraits. 
How can I make this more difficult? How can I make this more challenging, more rewarding, I asked. Nudes, I answered. I'd been thinking about nudes for a long time, but I hadn't shot too many. I'd drawn them, of course, in art school. I'd loved and cared about them, had had them in my life, all of which was why I wanted to deal with them. But I considered primarily three more specific things concerning the nudes in Redwood Saw. One, I thought they would enhance the feeling of vulnerability that had initially led me to portraiture. Two, I thought that they would make an interesting contrast with the forest. And they also brought in some biblical themes that I wanted to play with vis-a-vis -vis the Old Testament creation story. But most important, I wanted to bring the spirit of Eros into the work. Crescent City is a town that has a lot of young people. It's a very unhealthy town. You look around and you see people who are 50 years old and even 40 years old scooting around in electric wheelers because they can no longer walk. The town has one of the highest rates of teenage pregnancy in the country. And it struck me as I was doing the portraits how quickly a lot of these teenagers became adults. They have a couple of kids instead of going to college. It hit me hard how the story just goes on, no matter what the details of the narrative are. That this is the end all, the primary, the fundamental human animalistic impulse, bearing, making, creating children, carrying it on. No matter how despairing it is, no matter how dark it is, no matter how painful it is, the story just goes on, embedded in the bodies of these people. It's a gift that I was asking them for. It's a real gift of intimacy, and it's hard to honor that correctly. It's a great challenge to do the contemporary nude and to invest it with all the appropriate complexity and layering of signal. There is something essential about what happens when we are down to our skin. It's hard to get that correct in art, in representation. This is what you might call the exciting problem. How do I do that right? How? By whose model? These primal forms of sexual desire, I want that to be part of my work. It has got to be to reflect life in any meaningful way. I've been asked what my relationship is to irony. Irony is another problem for a lot of us. On the one hand, irony represents play and responsibility and ethics and everything that goes into registering genuine despair. It's our job, I think, as artists to expose those deepest repressions of despair. Of despair. The art that I respect most speaks to the most urgent fears and longings of being alive. Seeing and perception must be connected, and that is one of art's tasks. In 1969, Crescent City was severely damaged by a tsunami. This is the new town square that was put up afterward. Not surprisingly, the only people it attracts are occasional skateboarders and people who need to go to the bathroom. <coughs> I had a hard time with this picture. I came back and photographed this twice. Um, I thought it, it might just be the ugliest public sculpture in America. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'm working on a project now in Colorado and I recently came across a baby deer that had been hit by a car. It must have just been hit. It looked completely alive. The eyes weren't glassy or fogged over. A gorgeous fawn, white dots speckled on its fur. I'm trying to convey my sense of the world I'm shooting in now. 
A magnificent animal has been hit and is lying by the side of the road, bleeding, eyes still open, breathing, but paralyzed and about to perish. And that's how I feel about a lot of the beauty I'm experiencing in these places that have become sadly exceptional. I know how short-lived it can be. The culture is addicted to the kind of growth that its machinery is mandating, despite the awareness that all the, of all that comes with that growth. The great landscape photographer Robert Adams once said he didn't want to photograph wilderness any longer because wilderness was no longer true. All the flowers had been fenced and counted. I need to photograph both. I think that is still the only hope for telling the story I think needs to be told. There are still places in the world and remnants of wild nature that can be saved. But you have to bring the news to make the case to testify to the extraordinary wonder of it all. We've destroyed in two centuries what has taken billions of years to create. This is easy to forget if you're not looking at it. As I worked on this project, I had a kind of epiphany. I realized that part of looking is the transmission of something that cannot be delivered in any other way. I've had a fascination with picture making and have loved it all my life. I decided when I was six that that was what I wanted to do, and I've never changed my mind. I made a drawing in the first grade and something thrilled me, and I still don't entirely understand what that was connected with. It wasn't the usual thing of the teacher praising me. In any case, the desire to be a picture maker has never left me. Later in art school, where I majored in painting, I developed an awareness of what other people thought was important in terms of visual culture. Influence came into the mix, and I forded a wide river of uncertainty. I had graduated high school early, and I came from a visually unsophisticated family, people who did not truck deeply with images. Orthodox Jewish, it's all about the word. I went to art school when I was 16 years old with no other ambition than to draw like Michelangelo. But no sooner had I blinked than I was being pummeled with Marcel Duchamp. Then sophomore year rolled around and there was no such thing as a drawing class, let alone a drawing major. And to top it all off, nobody knew much about painting anymore. Painting was considered dead, but there was still the shell of the painting department lifelessly wrapped around us. Neoconceptualism was roaring its ugly prescriptions. It took a long time before I finally understood that the lesson they were trying to force feed us was that, was that there is a dialogue here. And if you want to be involved in culture at a high level, you need to take heed of it. But the problem for me was, I just didn't care anything about that dialogue the way it was being presented. I think my breakthrough moment came when I read Remembrance of Things Past. I had slogged through Joyce's Ulysses before I got to Proust. Ulysses was totally unpleasurable for me, but Proust was pure magic. I had a moment of what I can't exactly call recognition since I was going to go down that road no matter what. But it was, I felt, a moment of validation. Those two novels, written at about the same time, taking such a different approach, gave me a clear message. My revelation through Proust was not just of his formidable architectural achievement as well as his human insight. It was of his not seeming to care what the required dialogue of the regime of the moment was and of his trust that there would be a response to his call from those who were secure enough and awake enough and alive enough to return it. I shot this project during the Bush administration while we were all having to listen to a lot of talk about family and religious values. Things have a way of recycling, don't they? Um, 
I'd been struck by how many churches there were in Crescent City. One day I picked up the Del Norte County phone book and counted over 30 churches listed in it. So I began to photograph them, not knowing how I was going to work them into the sequence. Eventually, it occurred to me that the only element in the town that had as much of a presence as the religious institutions had was the fast food industry. So I decided to do a riff on the churches and fast food restaurants. It seemed appropriate. Uh, this was an interesting experience. I was setting up to photograph this KFC in a parking lot, and as I was doing so, this car just strung together with bungee cords pulled up, and there were two two girls in the back and these two guys in the front and they were shirtless and they were heading out in their car without their shirts to go have lunch in there and I thought oh what the heck I'll try and I asked them if I could take their portrait and the girl said no but to my surprise the guy said yes and to my greater surprise they got so formal about it that they actually put some shirts on um, and you can't quite make it out in this picture, but um, these guys are very young guys in their 20s, and, and their teeth are rotting out. Uh, crystal meth is a very big problem out in that part of the country. Um, again, this is what these two waitresses gave me without my suggestion, but I was immediately struck by the formality of the way they placed their hands. I loved the way it related to the tail of the carved wooden fish next to them, which circled around to the evolutionary themes I attempted to layer into the book. Every choice that goes into the making of a photograph should ideally be a useful choice. Uh, this woman was a forest ranger that I met on my first trip. She was incredibly helpful to me, and she let me use some of the Forest Service buildings while I was camping out there to load my film. Uh, she was the first person also who agreed to let me photograph her nude. She seemed very lonely and out of place in this town, but stuck there too, like so many of us get stuck in places that we can't love. She reminded me of an old Dutch motto, it's not necessary to hope in order to persevere. Uh, this picture reminds me of a wonderful and frightening truth that struck me from the Annie Dillard book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, which I mentioned earlier. Um, she said, we value the individual supremely, and nature values him not a bit. This young boy is standing against a wall that had been decorated with the painting of a flying eagle on its upper left side. The boy was a teenager in a tie-dyed t-shirt, hands self-consciously stuffed into his pockets, eyes averted from the camera. He was taken in a parking lot at the side of a building that was or had been some kind of veterans hall. And I saw the eagle. This became one of the few images where I just parked my camera and said, this is it. I'm gonna wait here and cast this picture. And I didn't have to wait long. Uh, he was the first person that came by. And I saw myself in him. He was a kind of doppelganger. I recognized a kind of oversensitivity that doesn't go over well in a small town. And this image of the eagle with its implications to me of the hypermilitarism and overpowering corporate culture 
that have overwhelmed the politics of democracy in this country felt unsettlingly significant. I also saw this eagle as a symbol of the brutality and the mercilessness of nature after having spent the time I spent in the forest. And I wanted the story to be balanced in that way. It's hard not to see how fearsomely the eagle is swooping down upon him. This is the transition picture to the seascapes that constitute the final section of the book. What interests me about this image is partly outside the frame. I shot it off Highway 1. Anyway, this woman appeared and she was gorgeous. She was a dead ringer for Botticelli's Venus. Tall, the same wavy light brown hair like the sea. A little bit chunky, those great western cheekbones and full lips and deep set blue eyes and she was a complete meth freak. She was walking down the highway with this child in his stroller, and I asked her if I could take her picture. To take a focused, large format portrait, as I've said, there has to be stillness enough for a 30th of a second or longer. I thought it was such an important picture. I wanted this picture of her with her baby. I took two exposures and neither worked. I wanted it very much. There was something very obvious about the extraordinary beauty and the tragedy unfolding. But I finally asked if I could take a picture of just her baby. It was easier for him to stay still for a thirtieth of a second than it was for her. If you look at that baby's face twice, you will see something you probably didn't see the first time. Which will also mean that this was not a good enough picture in the first place, since I have to tell you the story to make my point. But what you will get, I hope, from a second look, is that the expression on the baby's face has all the complexity of a gaze into the future. And he's gazing into the future in front of a cartoon illustration of our evolutionary past painted on a cinder block wall in a parking lot. I worried my way to the ocean. At first it felt a little too easy an ending. I struggled with too many shots. I understand the importance of water. I look at the world and I see water shaping every inch of it. And I wanted to deal with that. I felt overwhelmed, inept in the face of the subject. When I'm working on a project, I rarely show any pictures to anyone until I get to the very end. I like to let the images sift their way through my consciousness over time without any outside influence. I have a whole catalog of internal influences that have accrued over time, as we all do. I need to create a private space to find my way to my own story. I actually sent a first draft of the almost finished project to a mentor. He's a photographer whose name I'm not going to mention. He wasn't convinced by the ocean shots or by the forest pictures. At first I was in despair. But that despair became a beautiful thing when I realized, okay, I really am alone here. That means I have total freedom. I am going to do what I set out to do. I shot more seascapes. I edited their proliferations down to a few spare fathoms to what the narrative required. That's why the editing is so important to me. I've always edited my own pictures. And I've never allowed even a single picture to be changed, which is why it's taken so long for me to publish. If I don't have that essential stake in shaping my final effort, why bother? Why well, make the sacrifice? I don't disclose any new ways. I didn't pioneer any new light angle. So what I was left to do was to edit it down severely, to create a narrative circle. But even had I not stumbled upon the resolution, the ocean would have had to be there. Every night I was in the forest or in the town, I had to get to the ocean. 
and there was a lane down which I could drive my car right to the foot of the coast. That's literally it. The land rose above me, and I was scooped out into this private relationship to the closest thing we have here on this planet to the infinite besides the sky. That feeling I have tried already to describe to you of what lured me into that old growth forest initially, the need to experience my smallness and the expansiveness of time, to locate that place from which the imagination can throw itself anywhere. So that's where I wanted to end the story, where I began it in a way. That's why I think of it as a circle. To me, it was a circle. I finally just stumbled on the structure of Redwood Saw, but it was right for so many reasons. And that is the luck you hope to have when you're working. I've loved pictures all my life. The history of image making vis-a-vis -vis human civilization is impressive. I don't believe it's going to cease unless something fundamentally alters what we know of as human nature. It is a profound hunger the hunger to make the image, and the hunger to take in the image and to make sense of it, the hunger to pattern the world. That's what I love about photography. It works as a call and a response. The audience matters, but only when you work. And the only audience that matters when you work is the one that's in your head. The call is the stuff you look on. And the response is the poetry to which it gives rise. And the two are wed in the way you begin, hopefully, to capture how you feel about the world. Thank you. <laughs>